Hello, and welcome back to Cron CD. It's been a while since I last posted a video, so I wanted to open this episode with a few quick announcements. The scope of this project is changing from what I originally described in episode one. At this point, I've chosen to focus solely on the PC Engine CD and its impressive library of over 500 titles known to date. In the past, I would use common sources, but thanks to the Redump community, PC Engine Bible, and several other sources, I now have a comprehensive list of titles, complete with release date and developer and publisher info. I also have this information readily available to all in the links for this and future episodes, so be sure to look at them. From now on, the episodes will focus around the next title that I can dig deep into, usually about 5 to 15 minutes. As for the games that I play that I cannot expand much upon, those will also be in the episode, but only for brief synopsis and commentary. It's a method I grew accustomed to with early gaming magazines such as Electronic Gaming Monthly, and I felt it was the best way to present each episode. This allows for me to cover each game, but avoids random two to three minute videos that don't have much meat on the bone. Since I'm doing deeper dives, you can expect more widespread context of these featured titles and also expanded version comparisons. I will concede that my personal taste in games will likely affect the coverages as well, such as the fact that I don't much care for traditional JRPGs or sports games, but I'm going to try my best to be historically objective. I have also vastly improved the quality of these videos in a few ways. Originally, I was capturing emulation due to not having a proper scaler or hardware. Fortunately, thanks to the Super System SD3 by Terra Onion, I now have a flash solution that allows me the ability to capture high quality RGB video from original hardware. Also thanks to this flash solution, I no longer have to worry about a struggling optical drive. I've also increased the resolution to 1080p, which doesn't specifically integer scale like 720p does, but it increases the sharpness and viewer metrics show that most of you are on a 1080p screen. I'm using the XRGB Mini, also known as the Frame Meister, for these videos, and I chose this device because I've owned it for some time now. It's no longer commercially available, but impressive substitutes like the OSSC or RetroTINK 5X exist if you're interested in a scaler. I've also increased the frame rate from 30 to 60, given that it's the native frame rate for these titles. Originally, when I started the project, YouTube didn't support 60 frames per second, but this functionality was added shortly after I started. In the retro community, there are different schools of thought as to whether or not filters like scan lines or rounded edges should be used to emulate a CRT television. But personally, I've chosen to present the raw pixels without modification. Finally, while I know YouTube is the most convenient way to view these episodes, I don't trust videos on the platform for safekeeping. I am also uploading uncompressed versions of these videos on archive.org, so feel free to check the episode descriptions for links. With all that, let's delve into the year in review for 1990. When focusing on the PC Engine CD, 1990 is a scattered time for the video game market, although depending on where you grew up, you may have hardly noticed. In Europe, the computer still reigns supreme, but what computer that is depended on your personal taste. Anecdotes from listeners reveal that some were still playing the Amstrad CPC, which was discontinued this very same year. Amstrad would release a consoleized version of this platform, the GX4000, in 1991 to little interest where it would be promptly discontinued as well. Other notable platforms like the ZX Spectrum and Commodore 60 will continue adoration from its fans, but there's no doubt that the spearhead was Commodore's Amiga. In North America, a different war was waging with Apple's Macintosh and IBM's personal computer, complete with Microsoft's MS-DOS driving the computer gaming market there. In Japan, it is yet again a completely different split with NEC's PC-98 platform and Microsoft's MSX vying for position, but those with plenty of money to burn could pick up the Sharp X68000 if they wanted arcade-accurate ports. In fact, Capcom and a few other publishers used the X68000 as their arcade dev kits. All of these platforms, notably the Amiga, the IBM compatible, and the PC-98, will influence the releases of the PC Engine CD in 1991. On the console front, it's a slightly different story. Almost all platforms exist worldwide, but popularity yet again is diverse. Europe largely sides with the Sega Master System, which is already discontinued in both North America and Japan, but it sees notable success that continues well into the 90s in Europe. Meanwhile, in North America, it's all about the NES as a major tentpole release and important arcade port continue Nintendo's dominance in that market. In Japan, there's a three-way race between the Famicom, the PC Engine, and the Mega Drive, with all sales roughly placing the platforms in that order. 
Portables are also growing wide popularity, as the Game Boy stands tall as the most popular gaming platform for the year, no matter region. Sega releases a portable version of the Master System, the color handheld Game Gear, and NEC takes the PC Engine fully portable with the PC Engine GT, better known as the Turbo Express in the US, which supports the entire Hue card library. All of this is about to change, however, because Holiday 1990 is when Nintendo releases the Super Famicom in Japan, better known as the Super NES in the West. Despite its popularity, the Famicom was definitely showing its age, and Nintendo knew it had to bring out its own 16-bit console to rival Sega's Mega Drive. The answer was to be a fully backward compatible console that would support the extensive Famicom library, as well as usher in the next generation of Nintendo titles. Of note, the Mega Drive was also capable of supporting the Master System library thanks to the inexpensive add-on known as the Power Base Converter, which costs roughly $40. Unfortunately, the Super Famicom would eventually drop the backward compatibility as part of development, but the new platform was impressive nonetheless. Visually, the Super Famicom dominated Sega's offering by giving things that the Mega Drive was not capable of producing. For starters, it had a wider color palette, capable of 32,768 colors in comparison to the Mega Drive's paltry 512, and capable of displaying up to 256 colors simultaneously, while Sega's platform could only achieve 61. The Super Famicom was also capable of eight different display modes, with the infamous Mode 7 being touted due to its ability to scale and rotate, something limited to arcade games until this time. Some may note that there's a smaller resolution on the Super Famicom, 256 by 224 one quite similar to the PC Engine, in fact, while the Mega Drive typically used 320x224, but the graphics and modes dazzled enough to be a non-point upon release. Finally, the sound chip was a custom Sony-produced subsystem that allowed an incredible amount of depth to sound production as well as sampling capabilities, albeit highly compressed. <laughs> I do have to defend the Sega side a bit with the Mega Drive's Yamaha chip that could produce some truly amazing tunes, an easy example being Yuzo Koshiro's Streets of Rage composition, but far fewer developers were able to harness the strengths of that sound chip rather than the custom sound chip in the Super Famicom. With the stiff competition looming and the PC Engine standing as the only remaining 8-bit console in the Japanese market, it's surprising how little attention the PC Engine CD seems to pay to the Super Famicom. They will share a batch of titles, mostly due to the PC-originated ports, but otherwise, we see little response to most of the Super Famicom's library. Where PC Engine still pulled most of its attention was the arcade. Even though most arcade titles saw worldwide releases regardless of development origin, there was a new player on the market testing how arcade titles were made available. SNK, a known arcade publisher, released its Neo Geo platform in 1990 that provided both arcade cabinets and home consoles capable of playing the same games. In arcades, the MVS system had signature red cabinets that featured anywhere from two to six games for players to select and play from. If they desired, and could afford the astronomical $650 cost, players could purchase the AES console that supported all titles found in the arcades, with no difference between them, and even came with a sturdy arcade joystick. Keep in mind the console was only the first part of the investment, since these titles were essentially arcade boards in cartridge form, the cost for an individual game was typically $200 to $300. The fact that they were arcade titles also meant that each game was often short or had little challenge when the cost of each continue was at stake. Still, the Neo Geo was the holy grail of home gaming at the time, and I watched longingly as the AES was given away on game shows or sat on high shelves in my local toy retailer. The fact that I was able to play these titles in arcades myself only further enticed, especially since Neo Geo titles competed both technically and in gameplay to most arcade titles it shared space with. In the end, it's always all about the games though, right? And 1990 had plenty to show off. If you walked into a typical arcade, you would largely be greeted by shooters or belt scrollers, the latter still being the most popular. A belt scrolling brawler, also known as a beat-em-up or even fighter by some fans, has a pretty simple premise. Walk to the right and beat up everything you see. 
It sounds simple enough, but these titles were by far some of my favorite games growing up. During 1990, you would see late favorites from 1989 continuing success, such as Capcom's Final Fight and Konami's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I have done extensive coverage of Final Fight on this channel, so if this screen piques your interest, definitely check out my retrospective in the description. Shooters Gradius III, Parodius Da, and personal favorite Raiden also premiere in 1990. Even SNK's new Neo Geo has some impressive launch titles, such as Magician Lord, although true one-on-one -on -one fighters will dominate the platform in years to come. America also cranks out some unique arcade titles with Williams' Smash TV, an updated concept of the twin-stick shooter title Robotron 2084, and Midway shows off some new tech with Pit Fighter, an arena brawler that featured digitized actors as sprites. The Famicom has major RPGs to boast about in Japan with both Final Fantasy III and Dragon Quest IV moving units, but the patented Nintendo plumber is responsible for all the buzz on the NES in the West. Super Mario Bros. 3, a title over a year old in Japan at the time, finally debuts in North America after several delays and even a preview in a feature film to keep fans engaged. Once it dropped in the spring of 1990, there was no stopping it. Keep in mind back then there weren't set release dates per se, you would just be driving along past a Toys R Us and see a huge banner advertising the release of the title. Then it was a scramble to not only convince your parents to buy it, but to find a copy in stock by the time they had agreed. This commercial here may seem hyperbolic, but in fact, it's quite accurate. From the moment of release to the end of the year, Super Mario Bros. 3 topped all charts and moved over 8 million copies in 1990 alone. The NES also saw plenty of other notable third-party releases in 1990, Mega Man 3 being one of the most impressive among them, but another powerhouse would dominate the second place slot in terms of popularity. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 The Arcade Game I've already mentioned the Konami classic, but at this point everyone was waiting with bated breath to see if the quarter muncher would eventually come home. At this time, Turtle Fever had taken America by storm. Originally a comic book with some rather adult themes by co-creators Eastman and Laird, it wasn't until the four heroes in a half shell were licensed for cartoons and action figure marketing that they became household staples. By 1990, TMNT was on my book bag, clothes, bed sheets, and the cartoon was on every afternoon with the live action motion picture also being in theaters. Unfortunately, the 1989 original NES game looked quite different from the cartoon, taking most of its look from the comics, and wasn't the iconic arcade game we all hoped it would be. It was also quite difficult, even by NES standards of the time, and not all that fun to play. When Konami finally released its arcade port under the Ultra line, complete with two additional levels, it was a dream come true. I received this game for Christmas in 1990, and despite having played hours with the arcade version and nearly memorizing the game, I would still run through this title countless times at home. Alongside Mario 3, it was the must-have title for most NES owners in 1990. The PC Engine is doing rather well on the Hue card front. 1990 sees some pretty impressive releases for this console, many of which actually came over to the United States on the TurboGrafx-16. The first one is Naxat Soft's Devil's Crush, the pinball simulator follow-up to Alien Crush that definitely improves the formula, increases the graphical prowess, and has fantastic physics that definitely show off much of the PC Engine's capabilities. The second one is Pac-In Video's Die Hard, the licensed video game based on the movie of the same name that is ironically Japan only. For those of us that imported or grabbed the fan translation, you're in for a treat if you like the isometric bullet shooters, such as Last Alert in episode 16. Next up we have NEC Avenue's Legendary Axe 2, the follow-up to the TurboGrafx-16's answer to Rastan. It's an impressive one too, containing everything you want out of a sequel. Better graphics, stronger gameplay, newer levels, and tons of fun. And finally, my personal favorite, Namco's Splatterhouse, the PC Engine slash TurboGrafx-16 port of the arcade game of the same name, leaves very little to be desired. When compared to some of the lackluster ports of Sega's strongest hits, Splatterhouse hits at home everywhere they failed. The soundtrack is a strong representation of the arcade counterpart. The graphics, while definitely downgraded, hold up in incredible ways, and it really is a showpiece as to what the PC Engine is capable of. 
When you look over these and the many other Hue card releases on the PC Engine, it's important to note that compared to its CD counterpart titles, there is some similarities, but there is a clear separation. I don't feel that the PC Engine largely has a whole lot in common with the CD console, and it almost feels like Hudson is splitting the two with two distinct consoles that have two distinct libraries. Sega's Mega Drive was also continuing to put strong emphasis on bringing the arcade home as well, and in 1990 we see a slew of impressive ports. Afterburner 2, Shadow Dancer, Rastin Saga 2, or Naystar as you may know it, Darius 2, aka Sagaya, and Michael Jackson's Moonwalker all made their way to Sega's console. Oh, and there was also this little Capcom title called Strider, whose Mega Drive release was unrivaled at the time. Sega also had exclusives like Shooter Thunder Force 3, action title eSWAT, RPG Fantasy Star 3, and even a Disney game with Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse that was Gaming History 101's first game club, so be sure to check out the link in the show notes. Finally, the Super Famicom presented with a limited but impressive launch lineup. Alongside the console was Super Mario World, the fourth installment in the Super Mario franchise, now with updated graphics, new mechanics, and a new dinosaur pet named Yoshi. High-speed futuristic racer F-Zero also came from Nintendo, as did flying sim Pilot Wings. Contributing third-party titles to the launch lineup was Capcom's port of the arcade game Final Fight, Konami's port of Gradius 3, and Enix providing a brand new unique god sim Act Razor to round things out. For only about a month on the market, the Super Famicom was off to a very strong start. With all of these influences in the market for 1990, the PC Engine CD largely sticks to its guns moving into 1991. Keep this episode in mind as we progress into 1991 and the interesting choices of what was and wasn't addressed on this now aging platform. <laughs> 